This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory and Le'ilu Nishmas Yaakov ben Yitzchak, whose yard site falls out today on the 23rd of the month of Av, the day that this podcast is being released. May his soul be elevated in heaven. I have to say that this is not the first time that I am recording this podcast for Parsha Re'eh 5783. Earlier this afternoon, I recorded this whole podcast. Yeah, I thought it was a pretty good rendition. Maybe not the best, certainly not the worst. And as I was editing it, I noticed that there was a major snafu in the recording. It was making a clicking, clacking sound. There was something wrong either with the microphone or with the recording device, or maybe the wire wasn't in snug enough. Regardless, I did not want to give y'all that listening experience, especially because this is the month of August, as we mentioned last time. It's Torch Podcast Improvement Month. If I'm going to try to improve my offerings, my output, well, I shouldn't release a subpar product. So I just made myself a cup of tea, and now it's late Wednesday night. And I sat down and we're here in front of the microphone once again and we're recording and hopefully this will be a good rendition, maybe even better. I'm worried it'll be worse because sometimes, you know, you run the risk of just repeating what you said last time and not la- allowing it to flow in a more natural way. But that's okay. I don't want to give you something which is an inferior product. Now, regarding the podcast improvement month, we're still soliciting feedback. We want your input. We want to know what you like, what you don't like, what you want to hear more of, what you want to hear less of. Maybe some of the other things that we can offer, visit torchsurvey.com. Click the link in the podcast. We've already gotten about a third of the respondents that we expected. It's only the 9th of August. The feedback has been interesting and helpful, and I'd love to get yours. Torch Survey. Dot com. Click the link in the description. I will say that when I was editing the podcast, the first go-round, the aborted episode, I remembered that Parshas Re'e was the first week of the current street that we are on. You know, the first year of the Parsha podcast, we didn't miss a week. The third year, we didn't miss a week. The second we did, and the fourth we did. But... Ever since Parshas Re'e, exactly three years ago, we've been on an unprecedented streak, not missing a single week. And I remembered that two years ago, it was either Parshas Eight or Parshas Re'e, we had another major snafu while recording the podcast, that the microphone fell down on the floor, and the batteries fell out of the machine, and halfway through recording an episode, it had to be discarded. And I remember thinking then, as I do now, that what we're doing here on the Parsha podcast, it's so wonderful that the Satan wants to come and, and disrupt it. And therefore, he's going to throw us a curveball, especially around the time of the beginning of a new year of the street. So I guess maybe that means we're doing something right here. But that is okay. Let's begin the second recording of this episode. I'm really excited. I hope it's as good, if not better, as the first time. And I certainly hope that the audio is up to our standard. Towards the end of Parshas Re'e, we read about the festivals. This is a phenomenon that appears a few times in the Torah. I think it's once in, in Parshas Mishpatim, and once in Parshas Emor, in the book of Leviticus, and once in Parshas Pimchas, and now here Parshas Re'e. Several times in the Torah, the Torah delineates the festivals of the year and some of the things that we do. Sometimes it focuses on the sacrifices. Sometimes it focuses on other elements of the festival. And in our Parsha, chapter 16, verse 3, we read about the imperative to not eat chametz, to not eat leavened bread on the festival. And instead, for seven days, of course, it's eight days in the diaspora, for seven days we eat matzah, lechem oni, which is a poor man's bread. And the Torah tells us why. Why do we eat poor man's bread for eight days, or for seven days in the land of Israel? 
on the festival of Passover. Because you left the land of Egypt with haste, with speed, with alacrity. In order that you remember the day of the Exodus, all the days of your life. Our nation is very good at remembering the Exodus. Of course, every year we get together on the Seder and we have seven days of, of Pesach. And numerous times throughout the day and throughout the year, we revisit, we once again have a touch point with the Exodus. We emphasize it. It is a central component, a pillar of our religion. And the Torah tells us we have to remember the Exodus every day of our lives. The morning and at night. And we have to eat matzah for seven days. Why? Because we left Egypt with such speed. What does speed have to do with matzah? So Rashi tells us that the reason why we eat matzah to commemorate the speed because we left with such rapidity, we were in such a frantic rush to leave that the dough that we were in the middle of baking, the dough did not have time to rise and to become leavened. And in order to remember the speed of the Exodus and the fact that it was so fast that the dough did not even have sufficient time to rise, for that reason, we remember it by eating the matzah. And Rashi notes, and actually we weren't speeding, it was the Egyptians who were compelling us to leave at that quite inconvenient time that we were in the middle of baking bread. So this is an amazing thing. This is the, fo- the idea I want to focus on today on this podcast. The Exodus happened when the Jewish people were baking bread. And of course, there's a process to bake bread. You gotta mix the ingredients and you create a dough and then you wait. And during that time, the, the agents inside the dough, they react and the dough begins to expand. And once you have a, a, a fluffy dough, a leaven dough, an expanded dough, then you take it and you, you turn it into a loaf and you bake it. That's how you bake bread. For some reason, the Exodus specifically took place during part of this process between the making of the dough and the time when it would rise sufficiently so that you can bake it. Specifically at that point, the Exodus happened. And there's a question that's been niggling at me for a long time. I remember hearing it when I was still living in Israel. So like 12, 13 years ago. Why specifically is this the right time to take the nation out? Why did God specifically take them out in middle of a process of baking bread? They had intended to bake ordinary bread. You mix the ingredients, the flour, the water, and then you allow it to rise, to expand. And then they were going to bake the bread so that they would have provisions for the way. They knew they were, of course, pending the exodus. They knew they were leaving. And therefore, they wanted to prepare provisions for the way. So they were making bread. And before the dough had had a chance to rise, they were ushered out. And here's the question, question number one. Why wasn't there a more convenient time to leave? Right in the middle of baking, they were rushed out with such rapidity that the dough couldn't rise. And therefore, we eat matzah to remember the unrisen dough of the Exodus. But why did the Exodus have to happen specifically during the time that they were baking? Isn't that a suboptimal time to leave? Let them bake the bread and then leave. Question number one. Question number two is a little bit more of a technical question. Here we're told in this verse, chapter 16, verse 3 of the book of Devarim, our parsha, parshas re'e. We're told that the reason why we eat matzah, the lechem only, the poor man's bread, is because when we left Egypt, when was that? On the 15th day of the month of Nisan, when we left Egypt, we left with such speed that the dough did not have time to rise. And therefore, to remember the Exodus, again, the event that happened on the 15th day of Nisan, 
For that reason, we eat matzah. But here's the question. When was the first time that the nation was commanded, was instructed to eat matzah? It wasn't after the Exodus. It was actually before the Exodus, chapter 12 of the book of Exodus. This is on the first day of the month of Nisan, so 15 days prior to the actual Exodus. Moshe is instructed by God and commands the Jewish people about the calendar and about the pastoral offering. You take your uh, a sheep, and you you guard it for a couple of days, and then you slaughter it, and then you smear the blood, along with some other ingredients, on the on the doorposts and on the lintel, and then you stay in the house, and then all the instructions regarding the consumption of the paschal offering, don't break a bone, etc. And then we read, this is chapter 12, verse 15, not of our book, of the book of Exodus, that we're supposed to eat matzah for seven days, and not eat Leaven bread, namely chametz, for seven days. So we have a we have a commandment to eat matzah that precedes the actual Exodus. Why did we initially have the mitzvah to eat matzah? Now we're told that the reason we eat matzah on on Passover, it's remember the speed, the rapidity, the accelerated nature of the Exodus. The dough, even the dough, didn't have time to rise. But when did that happen? That happened on the day of the Exodus, namely the 15th day of the month of Nisan. But that came two weeks after they were initially commanded to eat the matzah. So how could it be that the reason why we're eating matzah, the reason why there was a mitzvah of matzah, it's because we were so frantic and it was so speedy, the Exodus happened so fast and the dough didn't have time to rise. How can that be so when the commandment to eat the matzah actually preceded the whole dough episode? So yes, the dough did not have time to rise, and we ate matzah then. But that cannot be the only reason why the matzah, or the mitzvah of matzah, was, was commanded, because it was commanded even before the Exodus actually happened. So what is the reason why the nation was initially told to eat matzah? This is a famous question. And in previous episodes... I believe we talked about this also on the Parsha podcast and also on the This Jewish Life podcast. There's a classic idea that there are two elements in the matzah. There's the matzah of Egypt, the matzah of servitude, the bread of the paupers. And then there's the matzah of the Exodus, the bread of freedom. And matzah symbolizes both the agony, the despair the suffering, the oppression of being subjugated to the Egyptians, of being a servant to Pharaoh. But matzah likewise also symbolizes the ecstasy of freedom, the ecstasy of being subjugated to God. And the Jewish people, as we elaborated on that idea, when we talked about this classic idea, the Jewish people, they were slaves to Pharaoh, and they remained slaves, and the only thing that changed over the course of the Exodus was who was their master. We had matzah in Egypt as servants of Pharaoh, and we still have matzah outside of Egypt after we left as servants to the Almighty. That's a classic idea to explain the duality, the the different elements featured in matzah. But this year I saw an essay, a short essay, by the great Maharal. And he says such an interesting idea, such a subtle idea, but an idea that gives us a deeper understanding on what matzah is and what really happened on the Exodus night. And this principle is broadly expandable. You know, today we're very far away from matzah. We're thinking about you know, the month of Elo's upcoming and Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, and then Sukkot, and then and then Hanukkah. And it's a very long time away to think about Pesach and, and Matzah. But the implications of this idea that's rooted in Matzah but broadly applicable are, are quite vast. Maral says like this, In order to fulfill the goal of the Exodus, 
It had to be that the Exodus happened specifically in the time, or in a time, where the nation would not have chosen to leave on their own. The objective of the Exodus is the forging of an eternal bond between the Almighty and the Jewish people. And it has to be that everyone knows, it's clear to all, that the Exodus was done by God himself. He took the nation out. He took them out with a, with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, and all the superlatives that we know that are featured in all the literature and the Haggadah, etc. It has to be clear to everyone. It has to be unimpeachable and incontrovertible to all that the Exodus was the handiwork of the Almighty. And therefore, the Almighty chose a time specifically when the nation was preoccupied. And if all things were equal, they would choose to actually wait a little bit. Let the dough rise. Let me forge them into loaves. And let me bake them. Only have some food for the way. The nation, again, assuming all things were equal, they would choose to wait a few more minutes, wait a few more hours, let, let it be a little bit more convenient. From the fact that the nation was taken out in a slightly suboptimal setting, when it wasn't perfect, perfect from our perspective, we would have liked maybe to allow the dough to rise so we can finish preparing the food for our journey. And that's when we left. That shows us that the Almighty, and only the Almighty, took us out of Egypt. The nation, of course, was eager to leave Egypt. Who wouldn't be eager to leave slavery, to leave servitude? And there was a risk that maybe the people will say, or the pe- looking back at the Exodus, the Exodus will be, oh, the nation left Egypt. But the essence of the Exodus has to be that, no, the nation didn't leave Egypt. God took us out of Egypt. He extracted us from Egypt. He pulled us out of the misery that we were entangled in, in Egypt. And that's the essence of the Exodus. That's the essence of this founding event of the Jewish people. And therefore, the Almighty designed it to be slightly inconvenient after all, you know, we would have preferred to allow the dough to rise. And therefore now, the fact that we left at a time that was suboptimal from our perspective, now everyone knows that this was a godly exodus. This was not something that we did. We, we didn't leave. God took us out. And thus the matzah, it's not just celebrating this, this, this trivia Oh, isn't it nice? We left with such speed. Oh, thank God, God took us out of Egypt, and it, and it was fast. Oh, and 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 the bread that we were working on, oh, we 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 couldn't finish it. We couldn't. We we made the dough, but we couldn't allow it to rise. We had we were ushered out. We were forced to leave. We were booted out of the land. It's not just a nice trivia. It demonstrates that the Exodus was not us leaving, it was God taking us out. And that's the way it had to be. It had to be that it was slightly inconvenient. So that way, this founding event of our nation, we're getting off on the right foot. God saved us. God pulled us out. God extracted us. And there's no room to argue that. We had matzah. And we eat matzah. And we remember the matzah to remember that the Almighty took us out. And this was always the plan. Even two weeks earlier, the first day of Nisan, the Almighty told them, you're going to eat matzah. This was always part of the plan. They were always slated to leave at a time where it's not going to be ideal. Because that proves, that shows, that demonstrates that we didn't draw this up. This is not the way we would plan it. This is not the way all things being equal, we would go about it. 
And therefore, there's no room to question, there's no room to challenge. It's incontrovertible that the Almighty took us out. He extracted us with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm. Now, this is a beautiful idea about the nature of the Exodus and the nature of matzah. Again, it's not just remembering the speed, the speed and the inconvenience and the, the, the suboptimal nature of the Exodus from our perspective, that is a demonstration of the strong hand, the outstretched arm, the fact that God took us out and we didn't leave. This is an idea that's not only localized to the Exodus. I think there's a major lesson here. There's, there's a principle here. The Exodus, God wanted to make sure that everyone knows that this is his handiwork. And therefore, he designed it that it should be clear to all, this is not our handiwork, it is his. I think there's a rule being conveyed over here. God is always involved in our lives. Every time you breathe, every time your heart pumps, every time your body works, every time the sun rises, we believe that the Almighty is behind it all. He is the force that's animating everything in existence. Nothing can be divorced from God. However, how aware are we of God's involvement? The Exodus, God wanted to make sure to all that everyone is aware that this is 100% the handwork of God. And that's why we eat the matzah. And that's what we remember with the matzah. But what about other areas of life? Other areas of life, not just the Exodus. If God is going to be manifested in our lives, if there's going to be an overt manifestation of God, God's going to be unimpeachably involved in our lives or in something that happens in our lives. There's almost a law. There's a law being conveyed here. If that's going to happen, then it is necessarily going to be in a way that we cannot telegraph, in a way that we would not plan to do it as such. It's going to be in a slightly off way, in a slightly suboptimal way in a non-ideal way. Of course, God is always involved in our lives. But sometimes we forget it. And the essence of our conflict of life and the aspirations of our soul in life and the identity of our nation is that we're never disconnected from the Almighty, even in our minds. And the Almighty is going to be actively involved in our lives. We have a precedent for something that was decoupled from God. That God said, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And that's the serpent. The serpent, he was cursed that he's going to slither in his belly and he's going to eat dust. And you may say, well, that's not a curse. That's a blessing. The serpent never goes hungry. But that is a curse. Because the serpent never has any involvement of God in its life. There's never any connection with the Almighty. The serpent never has delivered food, so to speak, from God. The serpent can always ignore the existence of God because there's always plenty of food. The serpent lives a life of total reliability, of zero uncertainty. Everything could be smooth and seamless. Everything can operate like clockwork. For us, we are subjected or we are the recipients of the benefit of having an ongoing relationship with the Almighty. And that necessarily means that is that there's going to be more variability. It's not always going to be ideal. It's sometimes going to be a bit suboptimal. It's not always going to be the way we, we, we draw it up. You know, a few weeks ago, we spoke about the differences between the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, and the land of Egypt in an episode that uh, I think is cleverly titled Middling East. You know how much I enjoy clever titles, puns, double entendres. We talked about the difference between the land of Israel and the land of Egypt. The land of Israel 
What separates it from other lands is that the Almighty is overseeing it. He's involved. His presence is undeniable in the land of Israel. And one of the ways that that's manifested is that in the land of Egypt, well, you have the reliability of the Nile. It's like the serpent. And you can forget God entirely. There is a way to ignore God's contribution to your life. Whereas the land of Israel, it's a land where God oversees it. The eyes of God, as the verse tells us, oversees it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And God gives you rain and God gives you sustenance, but that necessarily means that it's not always going to be exactly the way that you drew it up. I think an example of this principle is the contradiction or the apparent contradiction that we see in the Talmud regarding the idea of marriage. The Talmud tells us in the book of Moed Katan on page 18b that there is something that we know from many different sources, from the Torah, from the prophets, and from the writings, all three parts, all three components of the Tanakh, of our Torah, Navim, Tzuvim, our Bible, all of them talk about the idea that it is God who puts man and woman together, who makes husband and wife meet. This is something which is so well established. It's so well concretized in the literature as found in all three parts of the Tanakh. Moreover, the Talmud tells us that before a person's born, before they are formed, there is a prophetic voice that announces who they will marry and which house they will live in and which field they will work upon. Meaning, the major questions of our lives, who are we going to partner with in life? What is going to be our home, our residence? And what's going to be our field? What's going to be our career? What's going to be our occupation, our profession? Those are all predetermined. It seems like the the sources are telling us pretty clearly that God is the one who decides who you marry. He's the one who's going to take care of it. He's going to bring men and women together. Now, the Talmud elsewhere tells us, in the book of Shabbos on page 130a, that no marriage goes smoothly. No, it doesn't ever work out in a seamless way, with no problems, with no hiccups. There's always something that comes up in the run-up to a marriage. On one hand, we're told that it is God who arranges marriages. He's the one who puts people together, and he's the one who makes sure that everyone finds their spouse. Nevertheless, the Talmud also tells us that that process, the process that's overseen by God, it's never smooth. There's always some bumps in the road. Something always goes wrong. And we would think, well, if it is from God, it should be smooth. But no, just as is true with the Exodus, if things go smoothly, if everything works exactly how you planned, and you were prepared, and you were ready, and and it all worked out perfectly, that is a condition where you may forget God. If your dough rises, and you have plenty of time, and right when you're ready to go, you leave, you may not realize that it's God who's doing it. But when things go slightly awry, it's slightly inconvenient, there's, there's some sort of hiccup, there's some sort of bump of the road, there's some, some sort of something that goes off. Works out in the end, of course. But it's not perfect. There's something along the way that is suboptimal. Then you recognize that it's from God. There's, I think, a powerful idea. Our sages are telling us that it is God who's going to do it, and it's going to be somewhat akin to the Exodus. He's going to make his presence known. It's going to be an overt involvement of God in a way that's undeniable. And therefore, there's going to be something about it that you cannot plan. Because if you could plan it all, if it works out perfectly, well, then where's God in the equ- equation? And here we have this idea 
you know, the house, the field, the spouse. These are three things that the Talmud tells us. They come from God. What that means is, is that something is going to be unusual. It's going to have some element of matzah, some element of you maybe had one plan, but God had a different plan. And just as is true with the Exodus, God is taking care of us. And when the nation is surrounded by the splitting of the sea, surrounded by the Egyptians, Moshe tells the Jewish people, don't worry, God will wage war for you. You just watch silently. You be a spectator to watch his grandeur. On one hand, there's the element of, okay, we can rely on God, but it's going to come along with the fact that when God does something overtly, it's going to be a bit different than you expected. And I was thinking, you know, on the subject of reliance on God, there's a lot of variability amongst people. Some people have to have everything planned out and they have to know exactly what's going to be and they plan for every contingency, plan B, plan C, plan D. What if this, what if that? And some people live life and they have a tangible, palpable awareness of God. And I think you find that the people who have this reliance on God in a more expanded way, not just with the Exodus or, you know, with these major life transformations, where you're going to live, who you're going to marry, what you're going to do, etc. But in day-to-day matters, those people, I find at least, they, they're perpetually living on the edge. I know some people that they teeter on the brink of insolvency and somehow at the last second God intervenes, but it never works out perfectly. It's never... They never have the comfort of knowing exactly what's going to be. And they're always living actively with God involved in their lives. And yes, God does intervene because after all, he intervenes all the time. But for them, it's not just overt with the Exodus. It's overt everywhere. And it's, I would imagine, maddening. It's, it's nerve wracking. But imagine what kind of life that is. What kind of rich life? What kind of elevated life? Where the Almighty is with you at every turn. At every moment, every difficulty, every challenge, the Almighty is with you. And you don't have everything planned out and it's all, you know, on the schedule, on the itinerary. It's all what you expect, everything, you know, like clockwork. For these people, everything that they enjoy is a gift from God. If they're able to pay the mortgage, it's a gift from the Almighty. They're able to buy their kids new shoes. It's a blessing. I know people like this. I know people like this. People that are so intimately connected with the Almighty that in every area of life, the Almighty is involved and the Almighty intervenes. And the Almighty has to intervene because otherwise they wouldn't make it. And again, it's, it's you know, for simpletons like us, it's a hard thing to imagine. But this is really what's happening to the nation at our founding. The Jewish people are told, are 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 shown, are, are demonstrated to by God that this is His doing. This is His handiwork. In this area, in this episode, everyone knows it's from Him. And every time you eat matzah, every time you remember the Exodus, you're remembering not just the event that happened, but the nature of that event and how it happened and what it shows. The Almighty is involved. And again, for for the whole nation was like that by the Exodus. And we see this form of the Almighty's intervention in several areas of our lives. But there are people that this is their life. And I think it's a beautiful thing. You know, most people, I would say, live lives that are largely disconnected from God. And I'm talking about believers, people who have faith, who attest to their faith. But how involved is God in their day-to-day lives? How much are they going step-by-step with God, so to speak? How much are they living, walking with God, as the verse says about Abraham? To walk with God. Every step you take, the Almighty is with you. And the people that don't live that kind of lives, 
There's a crazy insight over here. Their lives are more likely to be seamless, to, to work out as planned. And everything worked out. It was, it was all as we expected. And they may think that that's a blessing. But that's, I hate to say it, it's, it's kind of the life of the serpent. And there's something really beautiful. And it's a very difficult thing. It's a very difficult life. But there's something very beautiful about someone who is living day to day with the Almighty. That's what happened with the Exodus. And that is what happens, the Talmud tells us, in these other major areas of our lives. And I will tell you, you know, we're, we are awaiting another Exodus called the Messiah. And there are many sources to attest to this fact that the Messiah, the final redemption, is modeled after the first redemption, namely after the Exodus. I think a lot of people who think about the subject of Messiah, they maybe have a picture of what it looks like. The Jewish people, they had a picture of what the Exodus looked like as well, and it looked like that they have bread with them. Just as the Exodus was in a fashion, in a way, where it wasn't exactly what they planned, and now everyone knows it's from God, we can surmise that the Messiah will be like that as well. I think this is a very beautiful and broad idea from Maharal. The Exodus, it's right in the middle of baking. And the nation wants to bake. They want to prepare food for the way. And they are stopped. And they are frozen in place. And they take out not bread, but dough. And they bake it elsewhere. And this is what we are remembering with the Exodus. Not just the speed of the Exodus, but the nature of the Exodus. It is God's handiwork. And this is what it looks like when God is actively, overtly involved. It's not the way you planned it. It's the way he planned it. And he planned it in a way that you cannot deny. You cannot question his involvement. And that is a mode of relationship, of existence, that will appear in other places in our lives. And, of course, for the righteous. That's how they live. And that is a beautiful and rich life. And I think this idea is something that we should ponder. How much of a life do we want to live like the serpent? Where there's reliability and, and there's a comfort. And it's, it's kind of appealing. I have to say it's, it's appealing to know, to, to have a plan, to know where everything's going to happen and how it's all going to work out and how it's all going to shake out and to know ahead of time and, you know, to be prepared. And, you know, probably it's a stable environment to raise kids in that they, they know. Certainly for children, they should always know. They should always have that comfort and security, I would think. But then there's this other kind of life where the matzah is the norm, where you're not just eating it seven days or eight days in the diaspora a year, but this is the way that you live your life. You're constantly relying on God, and God is constantly overtly involved in your lives, and your plans, they get discarded all the time. We'd like to end off the Parsha Podcast with a question. Now, you will recall that this is the seventh year of the Parsha Podcast, and we are towards the middle of the book of Devarim, which means we are getting close to the end of year seven. And I have to say that with the help of the Almighty, we intend to do another cycle of the Parsha Podcast with the help of the Almighty and with your consistent listenership and friendship. We hope, please God, to do another year. And I've been working on a theme for year eight. It's too early to reveal it, but I will tell you that I had a theme and then I tinkered with it. I edited it a little bit. That's the word I like to say a lot. I edited it. Edited it. it. Edited it. And I edited it. Sorry. I, this is the second time I'm recording this. You have to forgive me. Give me a little bit of window room here. And then I edited it. <laughs> and then I edited it. I tinkered with it. I updated it. I think it's going to be better. I hope to reveal it, please God, in the next few weeks. Stay tuned. But the theme for this year is the IQ, the idea and the question. And listen to this question. In our parsha, we read about the kosher and the non-kosher animals. And there are many proofs of the divinity of the Torah 
featured in the kosher animals. The Midrash tells us that if you just read chapter 14 and you learn about the laws of which animals are kosher and what are the criteria of kosher and non-kosher animals, that can provide definitive proof that the Torah is true. It's given from God. How so? The verse tells us two things which are redundant. The verse tells us all the animals that we are allowed to eat. And then it tells us the criteria, the the rule of what renders an animal kosher and what renders it not kosher. To be kosher, it has to have two signs. Namely, it has to have a split hooves, the cleft hooves, and it has to chew its cud. Why do we need to have these two lists? A, the list of the animals that qualify. And B, the criteria. Just tell us one. Our state is deduced from this that the verse is telling us that there is a criteria and there are 10 animals that fit the criteria and no more. Says Rabbi Akiva, from this we can prove the divinity of the Torah. Moshe is telling us that there are only 10 animals that fit this criteria. How did Moshe know that? Was Moshe a hunter? Was he a trapper? Was he a zoologist? Did he travel all over the world? Did he know which animals are indigenous to North America, to South America, to Asia Minor, Far East, Australia, Madagascar, that has over 100,000 animals that are not found anywhere else in the world? How did Moshe know that only these 10 animals have both split hooves and through the cut and none else? If Moshe got this information from God, the creator of heaven and earth, and all the animals upon it, well, it made sense. Moshe gave us the Torah from God, and God has that information. He is privy to all the knowledge in the world. But how would you explain this bit of knowledge if you challenge the divinity of the Torah? Continues the Midrash. The verse says not only the kosher animals and the kosher criteria, but it gives us also the animals that don't qualify because they have one and not the other. The verse tells us that there are three animals that chew their cud, but don't have split hooves. And there is one animal that has split hooves, but does not chew its cud. These four, and these four alone, are the exceptions. And again, the question can be posed. If you believe in the divinity of the Torah, it makes a lot of sense. Moshe received the Torah from the same entity, from the Almighty, who created the whole world and all the animals in it. it makes a ton of sense. But if you challenge the divinity of the Torah, you have to explain how did Moshe know this? Was he a trapper? Did he travel to Japan? Did he know what happens in Irkutsk? Does he know what happens in Chile? How could he possibly make that assertion? Now, what's interesting about this is that we believe that the written Torah, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moshe, and the oral Torah, namely the Mishnah, the Talmud, they are both divine. They both come from the Almighty. Now, of course, there are some details because there are parts of the oral Torah that were added later. But the idea that the Torah has a companion corpus, namely the interpretation of the written Torah that comes from God, that is our belief. Now, the Talmud and the Midrash and the Mishnah, they tell us a bunch of things right over here about kosher and non-kosher animals that prove that the oral Torah is also divine. The Talmud tells us that there are animals that don't have upper incisor teeth. All kosher animals, with the exception of one, not a young camel, all kosher animals lack upper incisor teeth. And therefore, if you find an animal that lacks upper incisor teeth and you know it's not a young camel then you know it is a kosher animal. Similarly, you can inspect the flesh at the edge of the tailbone of animals. And if that flesh is warp and weft, meaning part of it stretches vertically and part of it horizontally, 
then you know it is a kosher animal, so long as you know it's not a young donkey. And where do our sages know this from? How do they know that the only animals that fit this criteria are kosher animals? It's a tradition going back to Moshe at Sinai. And again, the sages, where did they know this from? There are so many animals, millions of animals that we've discovered. And indeed, the proofs from the Talmud stay true, are true today. Any fish that has scales, our sages tell us, definitely has fins. But the verse is not true. So, if a fish has scales, you know it's kosher, because you know for sure it has fins. But if it has fins, then you don't know necessarily that it has scales. Again, Moshe, he was not a marine biologist. The authors of the Talmud of the Mishnah were not scientists. And they definitely did not have a comprehensive knowledge of all the animals in the world. If the Almighty conveyed this message, conveyed this knowledge, well, it made sense. If not, it makes absolutely no sense. These are very strong and persuasive proofs of the divinity of Torah, and of course, of the existence of God. And here's the question that I want to ponder on. It's not a coincidence, it cannot be a coincidence, that both the written Torah and the oral Torah are proven, we have this airtight, incontrovertible proofs of their divinity from kosher and non-kosher species of animals. And the question is why? Why specifically in these areas, in the identification of the kosher and the non-kosher animals, why are these the areas in which the proof for the divinity of the Torah, or some proof, some of the many proofs of the divinity of the Torah are being conveyed? It's an interesting question. To ponder, it's always nice to remember, of course, that our Torah is divine. How fortunate are we to have the Almighty's Torah? How lucky are we? And we get to study it. Unbelievable. I appreciate your listening for the second time, even though only I listened the first time. I hope this was enjoyable. hope it wasn't too stilted. I wasn't speaking in too choppy a way. I wasn't trying to parrot over what I said the first time. Visit torchsurvey.com or click on the link in the description so you can participate in the survey. Have a wonderful day. Have a splendid rest of your week. An incredible, uplifting, sensational, terrific, spectacular, invigorating Shabbos upcoming, and please God, please God, please God, please God, this will come out good. If not, I'm releasing it anyhow. Forgive me, but please God, we'll talk again next week. And of course, the email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com.